Yeah, I'm going to try to multitask here. We'll see if I just uh, keep drowning this dual web technology here or not. So as we wait for this to connect, and hopefully it does here shortly, um, I'm going to share with you a platform that I've been working to develop uh, over the past couple of years. Um, so we've, you know, we've heard a lot of talks this morning. We'll hear a few more um, as this uh, program progresses regarding a number of different, um, oh, different kinds of data. We have forecasting data. Uh, we have some survey data, data that Eric shared today. Um, some information that Charlie shared about um, back to storage, some things that Arash shared about storage. So I guess I'm interested in knowing what we're going to do with all this data. And um, so what I try to do at least is uh, develop a platform. So uh, the program, just for giggles, I call it Silla Scout, because you got to call it something. Um, and so the, the point of this is to give us a platform where, you know, as the kind of the research arm of this program is developed deliverables, that we've got a convenient platform or a place where we can go where our producers or maybe more importantly our crop managers can make some decisions based on this information that we've been gathering over the uh, past four years of the project. Now, uh, one thing you have to do with this platform to use it is to um, enter in your um, Google password. If you don't have one, you can make one up. Or as I type mine in today, please don't use my password. Because you won't like what you find. Um, There you go. So, Neil, don't write that down. I know. I'm watching you. Okay, so the platform, um, it's, you know, it's kind of a high contrast. Uh, and that was with the point. The point is that you can use this on your phone in the field. It's device independent. You can use it on any tool. But, uh, you know, to use a scouting tool, you really want something you can actually see in the field. And what you see on this page, as you scroll across, uh, will... Uh, picture of what the eggs look like, so what your field manager is going to be seeing when they're scouting. So uh, the egg stage, nymph stage, there's a little bit of a delay between my phone and screen, so bear with me, um, and the adult stage. So uh, and beneath these images, you can see some years, and those years are the archive data, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so. Uh, you think you've got some psyllids or you're scouting for psyllids. Uh, this whole procedure, um, who, who's heard of Henry Ford? Nobody. Oh, okay. A couple of you. Neil, glad to see you raise your hand. Um, so I don't know that he necessarily invented sequential sampling, but uh, he definitely was one of the first people to, to use sequential sampling in his process of making model T's way back when. Um, John used, and, and Casey used, and, and, and it's good data. I'm not just pointing out that it's old. I'm just saying it's, it's a good way to do some analysis. Sequential sampling is a way that we can make a decision quickly uh, and relative to other uh, sampling procedures can get you through to a decision sooner than um, a more standard threshold. So we uh, developed, and, and let me tell you, explaining sequential sampling and providing that data to IT people is not an easy thing to do. Uh, if you ever want to catch it on that road, um, plan, plan way ahead. Anyway, so we've got this uh, sampling system that, that John's lab developed, uh, built into this protocol. So if I click on Start Scouting, it takes me to the next screen, which is either I'm going to collect a new sample or I'm going to resample. And the way I've um, sort of, for logistical reasons, divided up this sampling procedure, is you basically take a field and divide it in quarters. And for each of those quarters, you're going to sample three plants. And based on uh, John and Casey's sampling program, you're basically observing the topmost part of the, of the potato plant. And you're going to be observing for the presence of any silage. 
I'm going to go ahead and say resample here and hit next. The minimum number of plants that you have to sample, oh, I forgot I got a select prep ID here. I got a little scroll down that you can't see. But So, selected the test field here, hit next. Um, and so, uh, gives you a little information here about uh, where you should sample. Uh, the number of randomly collected plants are going to be three per, per wedge or a quarter of the field uh, within a 65 foot edge of the field. Um, and each of those uh, segments of that field uh, will sample 12 plants to make the initial decision. So, you have to sample a minimum of 12 plants. We may have to sample more. The threshold that we're using here, I think, is 0.5 psyllids, basically, um, before a field. This is based on LSO positive psyllids, uh, so managing for LSO, not for the direct damage from potato psyllids, you know, psyllid yellows and that sort of thing. Uh, our threshold is fairly low, 0.5 or 1. Um, so you can't really get 0.5 of a psyllid, uh, so basically, it's effectively 1. Uh, per field. So the sampling system as it is right now, it's, you know, it's basically if you find one psyllid, uh, in the first 12 plants or depending on how the sampling takes you, it might be as many as 50, but never more than 50. So we enter the first part of the field, or the first quarter, and what we're presented with are a number of options here. So these are just observations. We're going out in the field and you're observing the plant. And we really don't need to collect all this information. Is it an egg, nymph, or adult? But I thought it might be interesting to sort of segment these populations that we're sampling as to whether they're egg, nymphs, or adult. Sort of, sort of bet hedging that on some date in the future we may have some sampling protocols that are a little more uh, refined along this line. So uh, I'm out here sampling a potato field. This is plant one. And I'm going to select, oh, hey, I found an egg. OK, so select egg. Hit next. So this takes me to plant two, and we continue through this process, plant three, until we get to 12 plants, these first 12 plants. So it's telling me to enter the, the second quarter of the field. So we selected three random plants in one quarter. We're moving on to another quarter, and we're going to select another three random plants in that segment. And we'll just keep on moving through the field. Hey, we found a nymph. Here's plant five. Six, nothing. Okay, so the third quarter, plant seven, plant eight, plant nine, and our last quarter of the field of the first round of 12 plants is plant 10, 11, and 12. Okay, so um, since I found a psyllid of any life stage in these first 12 plants that we sampled, it's going to kick out a result that basically says that we've, we've reached the threshold to make that decision to treat. So it spits out this uh, data for you, tells you what percentage of the psyllid infestation was there, uh, and what the current recommendation is, in this case, is to treat. And it provides you a little bit of a table there showing you a breakdown of eggs, nymphs, and adults, uh, and the total number of plants sampled to to make that decision. So uh, in reality, uh, you know, over time we're going to be adjusting these thresholds. We'll probably have to build in some new tools and some ways to tweak those thresholds down the road. But I think this gives us an initial step, uh, at least with the platform to, uh, to start with. Now, all those data aren't lost. Um, that field sampling point is saved and collected, uh, associated with the login. Uh, none of that data is shared with any of the other um, people that are logged in, except for um, that point and the status of that point. So uh, I'll get to that in a minute. I think that's going to be at the bottom here. So if I go and I look at the archive data, so if I just want to look at the archive samples for 2014 for A, I can click on 2014 now. And it gives me the breakdown of all the fields that were most recently sampled and what the results of, were of those fields for that given life space, so in this case, A. So if I'm a field manager, I just want to know, um, you know the most recently sampled field by one of my other uh, workers out in the field, uh, maybe it was this top line. 
I can click on that. And I can get some field information about where it's at, so on and so forth. And uh, handy little chart here, kind of hard to see on this screen, but um, it's an interactive graph that shows you the um, portion of those aphids uh, across the season that were sampled in that field. And you can click on those various points and get the results, so the breakdown of the various life stages, eggs, nymphs, and adults that were found on that given date. Uh, you can screen through that chart if you really want to. You can deselect eggs, deselect nymphs. Uh, the chart's probably not something you might that you'd use on a little phone like mine. You might use it on a tablet or maybe you'd use it on a computer. Um, desktop computer, for example, might be more appropriate for that type of data. Uh, but at any rate, just to show you that that tool is available. Uh, and then you get a sample count for that most recently sampled event for that particular site. Now, let's see here. Jump back to my home page here. Okay. So in selecting that um, year information, I also get a map of all of the sampled locations, um, most recent status. So when you sample a field, it's either going to be positive, so you're going to make a, a treatment decision, or you're going to make a decision not to treat, or it's going to be in some gray area um, if you had a sequential sampling protocol that resulted in the gray area. Or actually doesn't. Um, what this will do is kick back that result with uh, red being that field was treated, uh, green was the most recent decision was not to treat, and if there were a yellow pin on there, that would indicate that um, no decision could be made and that, that field manager is going to come back and resample. Uh, there was some discussion earlier, I think maybe it was when Eric was uh, given his uh, survey data about how growers use that information. And I guess my vision with this, and this, uh, this platform, my thought with this is that you know, this type of data would be shared among all field managers so that you can make sort of a regional assessment of uh, what psyllid infestation is without actually knowing those numbers. So if I were, in theory, to look at this map and I wanted to say I had a field location, um, you know, say I had a field location in maybe up in O'Neill and I had a field down here, um, that just recently, so the last week's, uh, the last most recent sample was the decision to treat. This might trigger uh, something at this field location, which most recent decision was to not treat, uh, to maybe think about um, sampling more intensively for the following week. So this really is a map of decisions. It's not a map of population, if you follow me. Um, and so that's, that's the general idea uh, with that app which just disappeared off of my phone. But, uh, but I think I just got a drop, but that's all right. I think this is the end of the presentation. Uh, there's some other tools that we have available uh, on that as well. Uh, we've got some of our um, UNL circulars are called MEB guides that can also be accessed uh, online. Uh, I don't want to read them from the phone, but you can access them then uh, easily from uh, a desktop. So I think that's the gist of the platform we're trying to develop. Um, uh, I think we put that into our proposal, basically, to develop that in our most recent SCRI submission uh, for this project, which I don't believe was funded, but uh, that's all right. We'll, we'll regroup. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the idea. Um, right now, the app is web-based. Um, you know, it is fully functional as it is. It still hasn't been ground truth. I was planning on ground truth in it some this year, but like a number of others, there really weren't many fillage to ground truth this year. Um, so maybe I need to go visit Eric or something. Um, but uh, so uh, to really make this useful, it had to be a standalone app that wasn't dependent on an internet connection, uh, but that it could ping on an internet connection once it reached it in some range. So. It takes some more development to get to that point, but that's all I've got for you right now.